please let me allow me to introduce Matt, who's going to be speaking about reverse engineering flash memory for fun and benefit. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about the late start, actually. So uh, this talk is about reverse engineering the flash memories. So it's not the uh, Adobe Flash, actually. So I worked on a lot of other Flash vulnerabilities, but this one is about the physical flash memory. So, so the flash memories are used everywhere these days. Um, for example, the USB sticks you have probably it's using flash memories. And the flash memory is really small, smaller than a quarter. And all the embedded devices, something like a drop cam or smart appliances and cameras and phones, they are using some kind, some form of NAND flash memories. And the target device that we are, uh, I'm showing today is actually about the pause device you, you can see everywhere these days. If you are you live in US, probably you uh, saw this device. So this device uh, is from Verifone. So one of the main major manufacturer of the payment uh, device. And this device is really expensive, actually, around maybe. Eight hundred or thousand dollars, but from eBay you can buy some aftermarket device. It's like just thirty dollars, and you just open it up. Uh, the truth is that actually I'm not a hardware hacking guy. Actually, this device is the first device I ever uh, seriously hacked or reverse engineered. So I just look into the uh, inside, and I have no idea what other parts are doing, but. Some things are clear, right? So here, the Samsung CPU, it's ARM CPU, and the other two chips are Samsung uh, DRMs, and the other one is NAND flash memory. So you can just look up the model number from the internet, and you can easily find data sheet. And if you look up the uh, data sheet, you can find the specification. On the right side, the pins are for data I.O., 8-bit data I.O., and left side is for data control. And the first step, when you are using uh, NAND flash memory reverse, engin uh, reverse engineering method is actually doing disordering. So you might wonder there might be other way, easier way, to uh, not performing any kind of disordering or serious hardware stuff. So I thought of this. So someone actually are actually selling this from some market. So this 360 clip is actually for hacking uh, Xbox 360. So the way how they are doing is actually retrieve the formula from Xbox 360 and just modify it and just flash it again. So somehow this one works for Xbox 360, but it didn't work for me because, probably because, it's, because it is supplying some uh, current to the board, PCB board, and actually it's waking up other parts and it looks like it's interfering with our operation. So it didn't work for me. And this one is actually really expensive, like $50 or something, just clip. And the other option is uh, disordering the chip using uh, chip quick. And I tried this on other types of chips, but um, kind of this one makes the chips really messy and the PCB board is kind of like filled with all those remaining uh, solder uh, fluid or whatever. So uh, I didn't really like it, but other guys actually uh, use this a lot, I guess, but I didn't like this option actually. So other, um, the last option I found is just straightforward, just using hot air and just melt uh, the solder and just take out take out the chips. And to do that, actually, you need one uh, solder. Uh, what is that? SMT rework station. You can find it from Amazon or other places. And this model is just one hundred fifty dollars, and it has a really good review. But um, if you are just buying the uh, hot air station, it is uh, around one hundred dollars. And 
uh, the Captain tape on the right side is actually for protecting other chips from heat damage. So it is supposed to be uh, blocking some hot air, air blows. And the distorting procedure looks like this. You just uh, apply the hot air around the pins and you just take it out. It's really simple, straightforward. But if you apply too much heat, actually you can damage the chip physically and it can just burn out. And if you try to read this chip, actually you can't read anything because it's damaged. It will just re return 0, 0, 0, 0 or something like that. So, and here's a demo. Demo one. You can see this. So, just before this, actually, you saw that the temperature was 330 uh, Celsius around this, that, that temperature. Actually, that is the temperature actually you are using for soldering the the iron when you are using soldering irons for soldering. So I, I was just using same temperature for desoldering. So at that temperature, actually, the solder is supposed to be uh, melt melt away. So you apply the heat just around there, around the pin, and actually you uh, put the captain tape around uh, that land flash area so that you don't damage other parts. And the small parts actually can be blown away by the hot airs, so you can protect against that too. So I will, because we don't have enough time, I will go straight forward. So here, this part. Yeah, actually, yeah. On the right side. Yeah, it's really smooth. And there is no damage on other chips or other parts. It's really straightforward. And go back to the slide. And for the, this, uh, so after you acquire the land flash memory, and you need to retrieve the firmware, and there are a lot of different methods on the internet actually. One of the methods is using some special uh, SD reader brand, and you just connect it to uh, the land flash directly, and it is supposed to read the data, but it didn't work very well. And I tried many, many uh, other options, but the best option I found was using this FTDI chip. So this was introduced by Spy Mode, and he was just, he wrote a really long blog, blog about this, and he was using the FTDI chip directly, and he put other parts himself because he's kind of hardcore. But I'm, I'm a kind of newbie, so I just bought uh, uh, FTDI breakup board. This one is just $20 from eBay. And, and there are some pins, they are doing some uh, IOs and controls, and there are, yeah, they have, basically the breakout board is just extending the chip to have some basic functionalities. And one of the modes it is using, so actually this chip is really, really, uh, um, it supports a lot of different modes, so it can, you can perform a lot of different operations with this one chip, actually. One of the modes we are using is actually MCU uh, host bus emulation mode. Uh, using this mode, it's just emulating the bus from uh, 8051 MCU. This chip is, this MCU is from 1980s, and it's been uh, on the market for a long time. So, and the commands you are sending to the chip is for reading and writing. There are some specific commands for reading and writing through this chip. And the connections between uh, the FTDI chip and then the flash looks like this, actually. So it's based on the schematic from uh, spy mode, actually. Mostly based on the uh, schematic from there. And I actually tweaked it a little bit. Like uh, some pins like a CE chip enable, it was not connected at first time, but it is connected um, uh, with my implementation for some special operation. 
some data lines. So from the, uh, on the left side, it is the uh, pins from FTDI chip. On the right side, it, it is the pins from the uh, NAND flash. And they are connected uh, together. And AD bus 027 is supposed to be uh, sending and retrieving data, the AP data. And the data control lines looks like this, and WP, CLE, ALE. Uh, CLE is for sending command, and ALE is, is for sending address. So you send the command, something like read or write, and you, after that you send the write, which part of the memory you are trying to read or write. And, and there are other um, pins like uh, IO or strobe lines or control lines. Uh, and they are ju just a basic conce concept from electric, uh, electronic engineering, I guess. Um, so, and power lines, there are four power lines, you need to connect them. And this uh, logic analyzer screen capture shows the basic concept very well. So if you look at the channel two, it's sending the command first. You're going up, it's sending some command at the same time. The command is going through the IO lines. The eight IO lines, they are not shown here actually. And the ALE, so when it goes up, it's sending the uh, address at the same, same time. And the uh, RE, because this operation is for reading, so whenever the RE signal drops down, it signals the NAND flash that, oh, I'm ready to read something. And the NAND flash will uh, return some data for, so you are just dropping the RE signal for every byte. And these are the basic commands for, uh, from the NAND flash side. And if you look up the, so this can be differ uh, between every NAND flash brand, actually. But uh, these basic commands are very, very common between every uh, brand. So, uh, for example, there are read operations. Uh, there are three different commands. And for reading ID, there is 90. Page program is actually for writing uh, data to NAND flash. And block erase, you can just re erase a whole block. And, and so on. So according to uh, your own NAND flash brand, maybe they can support some additional special mode. So for example, read operation, you need uh, read one and read two functions. Read one is zero zero and zero one, and zero zero will, the f will read the first half page of the data, and zero one will read uh, next half page of the data. And read two will read some OOB area, out of band data, and those out of band data will be used to uh, record some meta information about each pages. The reason why the, you need two read one operation is that because the internal buffer is uh, smaller than whole page, so you need to split each read. So you can't read the whole page in one time. So read operation looks like this, but uh, because we are out of time, I'm not going uh, into the details, but uh, you can read, you can find a lot of reference materials uh, about this, uh, how the, all those signals work for reading. And actually you can verify that using logic analyzer yourself. You can just put the uh, logic analyzer on each pins and you can just catch the signal and it will help you to understand the whole operations. And the interesting part is from the um, source code side, uh, the, uh, the software side actually, uh, you can actually, it is actually doing the same thing as whatever it is doing from the logic analyzer, the underlying side. So from here, it's sending the command from the first line and it's waiting for ready signal, the second, second line is 370, uh, 327. And after that, it's sending the address and it's waiting for ready signal and actually it's reading data. If you go to this function, actually it's uh, uh, reading each uh, byte, uh, each pages, uh, but the thing is that, the good thing is the FDDI chip itself will take care of all those like underlying 
I.O. and strobe operations. So you don't need to take care of that. So that is one good uh, advantage of using uh, this uh, FTDI chip. Because there are some other attempts using Arduino to read uh, some end flash memories. I guess it will be more of a hassle because there are, they, they don't support that these basic functionalities from uh, FTDI chipsets. So the other equipment equipment we need is actually TSO48 socket, and you can just mount the socket here, and this one is really convenient. Instead of just soldering the uh, flash memory to break up board, and this is this is the final product you get using this uh, method. And you, this socket is around twenty dollars if you order it from China, and this break up board around 25, so under, under $50 you have really nice uh, NAND flash reader and writer. So the commercial ones, maybe they have really good functionalities, right? They can read and write much, much faster, but I, I guess it's more than $1,000. So this one is really cheap option. And the, the other good thing is that I released um, the one uh, open source project that actually supports a lot of different operations. It's not perfect, but it is a kind of starting point of supporting a lot of different chipsets. And uh, the current NAND flash memory that I worked on most is Sam from, from Samsung, and it supports some special mode from Samsung. And this tool works also for Windows and Linux and it's kind of multi-platform. And for example, uh, I just ran it from Windows and if you pass the dash I option, it will just display the basic information about, about the NAND flash memory. The name and the brand, Samsung brand. The I, actually, uh, the chip will re uh, return some ID field and the ID field actually uh, represents some special brand or something. So. For reading data, you can pass R option. And R and dash, dash uh, S option actually uh, specifies some special option for Samsung brand. I will talk it about later. And there is another demo. So for this one, you just run the Python. Yeah, you didn't read the data. So I just quit the uh, reading operation by pressing Control C there uh, to open the file. So it will read just first part of the image data, the flash memory, and it looks like a really random. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, random file, but actually there are ARM in instructions here. So that one is one page, zero x two hundred bytes. They are one page. This is one page, and the, uh, the part, the line, address, starting address 200, that one line is actually OOB data. For, so for every uh, 200 bytes, there is 16, or uh, what is 0x10 bytes of OOB data inserted. So it's not flat image, but every uh, page is there are OOB data. So they, they, those three bytes are for ECC, and the sixth byte is actually for uh, a bad block marker. And you can read past the at dash S option. In this case, the speed is really fast, 240K. But before, dash R option was like around 50K. So it's like four or five times faster. Uh, because uh, I'm using some special mode supported by Samsung. It's, uh, it supports some block, block read mode. So instead of reading page by page, you can read block by block. And in that case, the speed increases a lot. And you open it up, the image file again. Uh, actually, I passed, let's go back again actually. Here, when I pass the command from here, I pass the dash O option. It will just remove any OB area so that you can acquire the flat image. You can just uh, work on directly. So this image might be same as what you will get through JTAG. 
So it's your same. I will uh, pass it faster. So this one is actually opening the image file directly from IDA because the first part of the image file is actually uh, ARM instructions. They are first uh, first stage bootloaders. You can actually uh, directly uh, disassemble it. And this is ARM architecture. And make it called each jumping to this address. And then those are all those instructions. They are doing some really low level initialization. And it is really hard to understand, but still useful. So you save, I skip. And this is for writing the image file back to the NAND flash. So if you change something or patch some byte from the NAND flash, you can just write it back. And you can just put it back to the uh, device and you can uh, put it up. So I guess this is for this demo. So next part, the write operation, pin state. Uh, you can go deep inside, because I'm going to release uh, uh, this uh, presentation anyway. So also I presented similar stuff from Recon, and I deeply went into the details of this uh, whole, uh, whole thing. But I'm going to concentrate on other stuff uh, from uh, this presentation, actually. So this is for writing. And this is for using logic analyzer to capture how they work. So from here, actually, the software part starts. So as I said, there, are, there is a data, uh, the page, and there is OB area, and ECC, bed blocks. And the first uh, thing you need to consider when you are trying to reverse engineer uh, this um, and then the flash image is actually uh, ECC. ECC is, uh, the, the concept was actually invented like uh, 1950s when people are using uh, punch card to program. So whenever you punch each card, um, there are a lot of chances that you um, make mistakes. Just one or two holes uh, wrong uh, punch holes that will make you to punch every uh, holes again. So in that case, if you just uh, put some checksum at the end of each punch card, then it will guarantee that um, the whole um, punch punch holes are correct. And uh, above that, it can get uh, it can actually fix one or two uh, small mistakes. So this, is, this actually table shows uh, how this concept works for more than like um, NAND flash memories. So for this one, it is using 512 bytes of um, uh, page size. And each bit actually represented as one cell here. And uh, each uh, P here, the, these blocks, P8, uh, apostrophe, P8, P8, P16, and P1 and 2 and 4, these are actually representing each hashes, the parity bits. For example, P8, apostrophe, um, um, parity bits, you are using the first byte and second byte, and you, can, you, you are using the, just every even byte to uh, calculate one parity bit. For P16, you are skipping two bytes, and you are using 0, 1, and skipping two bytes, and 4, 5, and so on. And from the Python code, it's really simple code. And you are doing it for the columns, too, right? Bit 2, and, bit two and 3, and skip two bits, and bit, bit 6 and 7. And the code looks like this. It's really simple code. But the power, the power of this scheme is actually is here. So if you combine every parity bits, they can fit inside just only three bytes. And using these three bytes, for example, go back to here. Uh, if you think that, uh, for example, byte zero, bit zero is wrong, it will trigger P8 apostrophe, P16 apostrophe, and P32 apostrophe, and so on, it will make all these uh, parity bits wrong. And on the column side, it will make 
P1 apostrophe and P2 apostrophe and P4 apostrophe wrong. So by uh, knowing which uh, checksums are wrong, you can actually exactly pinpoint one bit actually made the uh, checksum error. And checksum has only two states, 0, 1. So if it is wrong, it will be the other one. So in that way, ECC can uh, fix bit errors. So that is the basic concept. And for basic, uh, the bad blocks, uh, the bad block checkers actually happens for uh, in the first and second page of each block. One block is usually maybe uh, 32 pages uh, for this um, uh, NAND flash that I worked on. So for example, this one, this is the start of the block and everything is filled with zero. And for Samsung flash memory, the sixth byte should be FF if the block is valid. So if it is zero, it means that the whole block is not usable. So here's a demo. Actually, if you check uh, flash memories, it is really common seeing the bad blocks. Usually you see two or three blocks, two, two or three bad blocks and sometimes like four or five. So dash uh, uppercase B, yeah, you see that there are one, two, and it is checking three, and four, four bad blocks. It is really common, so. Uh, and the other one. So actually you can dump, we are dumping the first bad block here dash B option will specify the block range. So we are retrieving 400 uh, block and we are saving it to file. Opening from the hex editor, you can see that everything is field zero, even the OOB data from yeah, address 205 uh, is field zero. So this whole block is unusable. So we skip and you can pass that C option, it will check the ECCs. So this operation is much, much slower because it's reading whole pages. For every page, it will read whole pages and it is calculating ECC for every pages. But usually you don't see ECC errors. I never seen ECC errors uh, from the chips I worked on. So this is it, go next. So you have some solid flat image. You can acquire some solid flat image using this method and we are going to next step. So if you worked on, uh, for example, a USB stick, maybe you have totally different thing, but if you worked on embedded device, uh, usually you should have some layout, something like this. So from the block zero, the first stage bootloader, will be placed because the, when ARM CPU boots up, uh, the microcode inside there will actually look for the, some uh, boot devices. If it find the NAND flash memory, it will just pass the control to the first uh, page of, uh, first block of uh, that the NAND flash. And after that, there should be some more uh, advanced uh, uh, bootloaders. Usually people use U-boot or other open source uh, bootloaders there. And after that, there are actual file systems, uh, JFFS2 or YAPS or other file systems. But in this case, uh, they were using JFFS2. And if you look uh, further, the, the first stage, uh, Bootloader looks like this, and it shows some very interesting strings, but it's really hard to understand unless you are uh, familiar with ARM instruction, uh, the architecture. And the uh, U-boot side, if you open up the U-boot code, it actually shows some very interesting str strings like U-boot parameters and all these interesting stuff. But also. The vendors actually modify the U-boot for their own use and they put their own stuff. In this case, it's actually um, identifying each platform. There are different platforms like MS, MX550 or MX570 and it, it is just identifying uh, those architectures. And for the U-boot images, um, these are the actually payload for U-boot. 
and they have their headers and you can just load it from IDA directly and but uh, the IDA doesn't support uh, multiple images uh, that well so in that case you can use my tool uh, dash u it will dump out the inside u with images and uh, it will save each file uh, each images to the files so one of the images were RAM disk and you can just mount it from uh, the Linux machine. And this one is actually Linux kernel. And kernel images you can load it from IDA. So here's the demo. One, two, three, four. Yeah, this one. So you pass the dash u small u will just uh, search for u with images, and I'm passing this very fast because we don't we are out of time here. So if you pass, uh, yeah, uppercase u you acquire like. Uh, uh, four different files. So it has two UBoot sections, and each one, the first UBoot 00 has two uh, files inside it because it's a multiple image. And the good thing is that you can open it up from the hex editor, and there is uh, the header. Passing it along. Yeah, I'm loading one of the images from IDA. I set the CPU to ARM. And it shows the uh, disassemblies directly. So you can understand what they are doing. Uh, I'm passing along faster. So the other image is actually uh, archived image, and you can just unzip it. And that one is actually file system. So you just open it up, it's filled with zero, but if you go down, there are much more interesting strings, some file names, something like that. And you just pass. So, and that's it for extracting. But if you copy it to Linux machine, the image you just acquired, uh, this image, and that one is almost 8.4 megabytes. And if you use a file command, it actually shows that uh, it is ext2 file system. And using the uh, MTD RAM or uh, MTD device, you can actually mount it. DD, uh, I have all the details inside the slide, so it's just flashing it and mount it. EXT2, and if you go inside to the directory, actually, you can access every file there. And you can modify the file, and you can use DD to uh, create a uh, EXT2 image, and you can flash it back to the land flash. And you, you hacked just the device. So, yeah, there are a lot of interesting stuff there, but uh, we are skipping it. So JFFS2, the, the most interesting part is actually J, JFFS2 because the, the, what is that, RAM disk is just containing some very, very basic binaries, but JFFS2 has a lot of interesting vendor-specific data or files, binaries there. So the good thing is that for JFFS2, um, the auto band data, uh, contains the marker for JFFS2. So it's extremely easy to identify JFFS2 file system if you have an end flash row image. So this specific uh, bytes here, A519, uh, these are used for identifying JFFS2 file system. So if you find these bytes from the first page of each block, the whole block is for uh, JFFS2. So it's really easy to extract it, and you can do the same thing as what I did for uh, RAM disk to mount it to the Linux system. You can modify it, and so on. Uh, so there is a demo, JFFS2. 
Oh, this is for mounting extraction. Uh, the tool, dump flash tool, will support it. The Python dump flash, and you pass uh, small. If you pass dash f, and you can specify the image file you acquired before previously, and uh, this command actually found two. Uh, different uh, JFFS2 file system. One is very small, the other one is big. And if you pass uh, capital J, it will actually dump out that image, removing any OB data so that you can just directly work on the file. So it just dumps out, we skip. Yeah, it takes some time. Yeah, and that's it for this one. And you can mount it from the Linux system. Just, this one is around uh, 61 or 2 megabytes. From here, and you are doing the same thing as the uh, RAM disk and DD. And you mount it, and you go there. And there are a lot of interesting stuff. Some, uh, the pause related programs there, some uh, custom programs and users and passwords. There are passwords there. Maybe you can try to crack them or maybe some default passwords. And there are a lot of interesting stuff there. And the, the other stuff is the last step is actually resoldering the chip back to the, uh, the machine. Uh, there can be a lot of, you need some training actually, skills for this. You maybe ruin a lot of boards. But eventually you can do this because I could do this. Actually, I couldn't do, I was not, really hardware guy. So I, let me see one, so this one. So you put the flux on the pins. First I'm skipping it, so flux. And I was using some drag soldering. I'm not really good at this, but it's showing just one of the methods that I was used. So in there, basically you are repeating all these and you are just removing the bridge. And it takes, for this one, it took almost four minutes for one side. So the other side, the four minutes, it takes like um, 10 minutes. So under 10 minutes, you can just uh, putting it back to the board and you can just boot up the machine and usually it works well. So the last part here, so we have only three minutes. So you can, maybe this one is from some commercial option. You can buy this, and if you put it to the board, actually you can mount the flash directly. But this one is really hard to solder because of this angle here. And so I come up with this, some development board. So you put um, this uh, socket here, and use flex cable, and you can extend it to outside, and using breakout board, you can connect it to the, um, the socket, T-sub socket directly, and I suspected whether this will work. It worked fine. So you have some development board yourself uh, under maybe $20 in this case. So I went further and put other port, other pins here. So one side it's connected to the programmer, the other side it's directly connected to the flash memory. So one side you program, and the other side it's just, you just put up the device and, and so on. And this one is the last part. I have only two minutes, but this one is a really interesting part because the te temper detection thing. So these pulse devices are really popular target from, from the hardware uh, hackers or underground people because you, if you temper it and somehow you can so sell it to someone if, or you can use it to someone, uh, you can collect uh, the credit card data, track one, track two data using this if you can put some Trojan horse or whatever inside it. Uh, this one, I don't know. So they are selling it from the underground market. You can see a lot of advertisement like this. And for the device uh, that I worked on, they have some temper detection thing. For example, the stickers there, if you unscrew it, you should temper it. But the thing is that you can use some 
uh, hair dryer, maybe. I didn't try it uh, that much, but you can find a lot of uh, videos doing that. So maybe you can use that method to, to temper it. But the other really serious temper detection is actually inside it. So the left side is front cover, and the right side is the back cover. And if you look at this, uh, the, there are some connection points here, 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 here. And they are supposed to be connected to each other. But how? Uh, it's through this device, this plastic device here. So if you look at it cl closely, so there is uh, this uh, rubber thing, some plastic thing, and there are some uh, contact points. The really interesting thing is this, the whole outside of this plastic is actually connected through a cable. And the cable is using some kind of paint that can uh, pass the current through. So if you try to temper it in any way, it will cut the cable. Yeah, I have only two, two slides. So, so if you try to temper it anyway, it will break the connection. So in that way, uh, the chips inside the bare phone device will know that the cover has ever opened. So there is no way to access a CPU or NAND devices directly without uh, not cutting the current between uh, front and uh, back, back panel. And probably something is running constantly there and checking for the uh, co uh, connections. So if you temper it and co uh, connect it back together, actually the software knows it. So you temper the device and you should clear it. But I don't know how to clear it because it's a kind of proprietary uh, information, right? So you might need some special device or software to clear it. But the thing is that from the JFFS to fire system, there is a process called the sys mode. And if you disassemble it, and there is a source code, uh, the disassemble code, it exactly branching, and you can just patch it somewhere here, and you can just bypass the whole thing. So the thing is that um, the hardware scheme is really, really genius, right? You can't put anything inside the device without breaching the hardware uh, that like a plastic uh, uh, device. But the software from the software side, you just flip one one byte and you can just uh, breach whole uh, hardware protection uh, temporal detection thing. So uh, the thing is that so this one is the last slide actually, almost last slide. So. Uh, the question here is that does uh, security by obscurity work? Because the very phone uh, SDK uh, is uh, very uh, distributed very limitedly, limitedly to those who take their training, who identifies themselves, and the training costs like 20K or uh, something like that. So the SDK is not public and it's really hard to acquire the SDK. So in that way, they are control uh, the security of the device. But if you use NAND flash thing or other technique, uh, if you open up the files inside the uh, file system, uh, everything is too simple. Just change one byte, a whole uh, tampon detection thing is just uh, uh, broken. So there is one point here, and the conclusions, uh, you can use NAND flash uh, memory uh, uh, technique to uh, the situations where you can't use JTAG. Especially for USB stick uh, researches, I guess USB stick doesn't have any JTAG, right? So in that case, you can use this method to dump the low level structure from USB devices. It will be really interesting how they, all those uh, USB de devices from uh, the markets are working. So I'm really suspect suspecting whether they are really removing the files when you are removing the file from the, your operating system. So maybe it will be a really interesting topic. And temper detection doesn't work uh, if you are using some other method. And that is the conclusion. And credit to, to Sprite Mode for the original design for the NAND Flash Reader and Writer and NAND Tool from the Sprite Mode and other guy, uh, Colors. I don't pronounce his, his name well. So yeah, thanks for uh, those people. So without the information from them, I couldn't come up with other things. And that's it. So maybe we have some questions. If you have questions, you can come up to the front. Yeah. That's it. Thank you.